Thank you for listening to A Glimpse of the Kingdom. A Glimpse of the Kingdom can remain free because of generous donors like you. If you'd like to donate, feel free to do so online, or you can send payments through Facebook Messenger. Don't forget to tell your friends about it so that they can enjoy this ministry as well. Be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any podcasts. You can listen to my daddy every single day, like in the gym, in the car, or just at home. Glimpse of the Kingdom is awesome! Hello, thank you for listening to A Glimpse of the Kingdom. I am David Pendergrass. Back here again, my friend Ryan from California. And just to honor you, Ryan, I'm wearing my Lake Tahoe t-shirt that I got from Target, I think it is. Oh, nice, yeah. Does it look legit? It does, yeah. You look like you've been there, yeah. (laughs) How else can I look Californian? Like dye my hair? I have just a Um, bad image, I think, of California. (laughs) There's a woman checking him out today at uh, Kroger. We call him Dylan's here. Yeah. Her hair was, was it lime green, neon yellow? I think so, but I felt like I was back in at and I home. Said, yeah, I didn't mean that meanly. <laughs> I I thought, what I, <laughs> a couple people cut us off in traffic, and he was, I was said, transported. Like I home, looked yeah. around. It's like <laughs> I felt like I'm at home. I yeah. almost died in the car. Right? My car was out front. Yeah. I was like, "What's going on?" It's so bizarre. <laughs> I thought I was in Kansas, but I guess we're not in Kansas anymore. Ryan and I met on uh, ChristianMingle.com. We were, that's just a joke. We were, <laughs> yeah. We, um, we actually, Ryan found my podcast and he was listening to uh, the much, much more superior podcast of Bill Craig, William Lane Craig, and he looked at some other stuff and found mine. And that's really it. About a year ago, I guess it was. And mm-hmm. that sounds about that's right. over a year ago yeah, now. Wow. Yeah. And uh, so that yeah. must have been pretty early on. Yeah. And just started writing emails back and forth and we started talking and I said, Ryan, come visit. Mm-hmm. So it's been pretty cool, man. I'm yeah. glad you've been here. Yeah, thanks you, a lot. It's been real cool. Yeah. And so we've been talking about all kinds of stuff, uh, mostly not deep. We've been having <laughs> birthday parties and chilling. Yeah. Um, let's do let's pizza. do this disorder. Let's do the disorder. Pizza, first. donuts, cinnamon roll pancakes. Those are the best. Oh, yeah. He had a cinnamon roll pancake this morning. It's outstanding. Ryan and I were talking recently about, well, a few things, of course, but one of the things was about mental illness and disease and it reminded mm-hmm. me of a, a message of a email you might say from a listener not long ago uh, just a very sad very sad thing and I just wanted to piggyback that he and I had a great mm-hmm. conversation about that this this mom wrote to me and she said several things but I'm gonna just read part of the yeah. message to you this I'll read part of it here she says second paragraph I have wanted to write you for months about another serious issue substance use disorder which is legit by the way mm-hmm. But I never have. Dealing with the disease takes just about all I've got to get through a day. And I've not felt strong enough to even try and pin my thoughts. I have a beautiful, smart, amazing 25-year-old daughter who's addicted to crack cocaine. Mm. She said, it can affect middle class white America too! Exclamation. Similar to your description of PTSD, science is proving that an addicted brain has changes to neural pathways and dopamine and other brain chemicals that make beating it, quote, through 12-step programs and or Jesus alone, very difficult. Mm-hmm. Triggers and flashbacks are extremely ingrained in SUD2, as are cravings. Because of this, I don't believe it is a moral failing alone. Okay, the choice to do drugs in the first place was, but addicts are not undisciplined, weak, horrible individuals. Once addicted, mm-hmm. they are ill, just like one with cancer or diabetes, and we don't call them to repentance from the disease. So much more research is needed. And I'm not opposed to medication, but sadly, there is none for crack addiction. Maybe one mm-hmm. day. Unfortunately, my daughter will have little to do now with a church that does not does nothing but condemn her for being a, quote, massive sinner. We both get it. Yes, we are sinners in need of a savior. But let's be real. The church views addiction, really the behaviors associated with addiction, as so much worse than most other sins. A major moral failing, evidenced whether realized or not, and how often it's used leading up to or in almost every sermon closing or invitation. And after 45 years in church, sadly for the past 18 months, I haven't either. And then she goes on to say that she knows God the Father and she's mm. still very much you know, yeah. has faith. Uh, and she says, I know that God could choose to heal my friend with cancer and he could choose to heal my daughter with SUD, but he also could choose not to. And then she, she finishes basically on this. I just wish the church would become educated around the issue and start helping in the slow process of changing the tide of public opinion. And she says, I might disagree with her, but she hopes that, you know, basically not. And But she don't want people to keep suffering. 
And she said some other very kind things about me and my podcast. I wrote mm-hmm. back to her and told her how very, very sorry I was for her that she's going through this. And I'm very sorry her daughter is addicted. Yeah. And I'm very sorry that her daughter has stopped going to church. And I'm very sorry that at all she's had, she's been affected by that. Just, that stuff just breaks my heart. And I, I wrote to her and I thought maybe worthwhile on a podcast to say the same kinds of things, which yeah. is at minimum, I would say nowhere in the Bible do we have this idea of a mental illness? Hmm. The closest we get to it is by the descriptions of things that today we would call caused by a mental illness, like yeah. the one who thrashes himself with the teeth and right. that he has demoniac. Yeah. And because we read the b- description of that, most skeptics and some Christians through the ages have said, well, he didn't have a demon, he had a mental illness, Jesus healed him, he didn't really cast out a demon, he cast out a mental illness. Yeah. Well, maybe, maybe. Right. But that's anachronistic, right? It seems to me, and I don't want to put on the lips or mind of an ancient author or auditor what they might have written or intended or heard, right? Yeah. But having said that, it's not there. Uh, that's one thing to be very clear. The, it seems to me, and maybe you'll disagree in the podcast, and y'all can write to me and tell me. I can't find anywhere where they have a concept in the ancient world, anywhere in any ancient literature of what we might call mental illness, the way it's so defined today. They did believe people had dispositions. They did believe in things that today we call orientation. Mm-hmm. They didn't use the exact vocabulary, and that's fine, but they did have that. And I have no doubt at all that people had the idea that a person had certain disposition and attitude. Mm-hmm. But a sense of a mental disease that we get, particularly when it comes to addiction and so forth, and the clarity with which we have that now, no, they didn't have that. The second thing I would say is the New Testament, Old and New Testament, but particularly when it comes to the teaching of Jesus, they never thought that having these mental issues was a sin. Mm -hmm. So if a person, what I mean is, what I mean is I can't find anywhere where Jesus talks about a person's attitude or disposition itself as sinful. He does attack their lack of trust, right? You little faith, but I can't find anywhere where it says, Peter, you worry all the time. Mm -hmm. You're a worry wart. (laughs) You must have generalized anxiety disorder. You need to repent of the GAD and get on with life. Right, yeah. You know, Andrew, I've told you, put the crack down. (laughs) So whatever, I'm not trying to make fun of crack. My point is we don't find that. So because of that and other reasons, I don't find it compelling when maybe well-intentioned Christians and Christian leaders think that things like this is a sin. I don't think it is. I think it is a mental illness. I think it is a disease. I completely concur with this very caring mom that... A person can choose, of course they choose when they start, and there are moments of clarity. Almost any addict will tell you that. I, I've talked to many addicts. Mm-hmm. There are times when the disorder, the, the the substance is calling their name less, and they go, I need treatment. Or maybe they're in severe depression, they go, I need to get some treatment. Maybe right. they have a severe character disorder, and they go, I need to get some treatment. And that's why a lot of times they do. Now, sometimes they have got to bottom out to get to that place, but whatever, there are the moments. They have the moments of clarity. In that moment, they have much more, you might say, freedom right. than the times when the addiction's coming on. What they do in the moment of clarity does matter. Mm-hmm. And But in my my view, what matters in the moment, if there's a, if there's a biblical rubric under which we would put what to call that struggle is self-control. And, of course, Paul would say that's a fruit of the Spirit is right. to have self-control. Yeah. Then the question is, does self-control count when it comes to when the addiction is taken over? Right. So, obviously, when a person has a crack addiction, mm-hmm. they have lost self-control when they're doing it. And when they're going to do they sell everything they own or to get the meth. They just right. give up on it. I mean, that's, it's just so sad. In my view, I'm convinced, until otherwise, I'm convinced that in those moments when the addict is doing what the addict's going to do, they are genuinely a victim right. to a physiological disorder of the brain. Mm-hmm. They are being victimized. And if you're a victim, if you do not have control of the choice you're making, you are not morally responsible for the choice you're making. Mm-hmm. That's basic philosophy of moral ethics, which is why, a little footnote, I find it so, one of the reasons I find it so uncompelling and frustrating when there are atheists and skeptics and whatnot who say that all the time about how 
um, we're all determined and that atoms determine everything and our brains determine all from evolution and whatever. If that's true, then there's no such thing as morality. There's no such thing as believe what I'm saying is true because your brain cells are making you think that and feel it, which means, well, then how could God kill all the Amorites? Like they're really upset about this ancient race they don't give a rip about, but yeah. how could he do that? What difference does it make? Yeah. They thought God made him do it. If you're just, if you're a determinist, what difference does it make? Right. How could Hitler do that? He didn't have a choice. Yeah. Right? He's all determined. Well, that's mm-hmm. silly. They're not determinists. Right. They think the thoughts they're thinking in that moment aren't really thoughts. They're not, I mean, they think they're thoughts, not just brain chemicals. Right. Brain on the movement. Yeah. All that to say, that stuff is very frustrating. Right. So I do think that <laughs> they're not determined. In yeah. the moment when we feel like we've lost that sense of determinacy over our own actions, then we know for a fact the person has been victimized. Yeah. They're victimized to it. And I don't think being a victim is a sin. Right. I don't think what I'm saying. I know you, you and I have chatted some about that, um, and I'll be happy to chat about it. You know, if we want to talk more, right? I struggle with post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm-hmm. Um, people have it worse than I do, that's for sure, because I've met some that have it worse. I know they're worse, but I struggle with it. Yeah, and I've met people all through my life who have that. And I just want to end on this for now. We can yeah, keep, yeah. keep talking. Um, well, at least I've done all the talking, and you're such a good listener. Is um, <laughs> is what breaks my what heart? Did you say to start? What? Well, I don't know. <laughs> can you start from the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> what Chris Pratt said in Lego movie is, I think, I think I got everything, but say it all again because I wasn't listening. I think I understand. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> say it all over because I wasn't listening. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, what yeah. uh, is? It breaks my heart. Like I said, I feel such sadness for those who have been turned away from the church because of this mm-hmm. this what I'm convinced is a misunderstanding yeah and I tell you what I'll wait for this so what do we do about this I'll go there I'll go there in a little bit mm-hmm. I want to hear but that's that's my initial thoughts of the sadness for that and my beliefs about disease and mental illness right yeah yeah and I mean you know for myself I I have I have depression and um, obsessive compulsive disorder and I've been going to therapy same therapist therapist for about 10 years uh is also a psychiatrist um and i take medication for it been hospitalized a couple times for um some pretty intense uh suicidal thoughts um Mm -hmm. you know i didn't i didn't attempt or anything but it was uh very uh very disturbing and you know some real low points for me and i just uh Mm -hmm. i can't you know say enough about the great people that God has put in my life, especially my therapist, therapist who's also a Christian. Mm-hmm. He doesn't advertise himself that way, but he's mm-hmm. um, definitely a believer. And just having that that fellowship and also friends and family that have been, you know, very supportive of me, it's made a huge difference for me. And um, you know, from where where I've been at my lowest to you know where I am now, it's um, you know it's night and day. And you know, I think it all works together you know, in terms of therapy, the medication. But I mean, I really feel like God has really been in control this whole time of like, you know, help guiding me to these, mm. to these mm. right people. Mm. And, you know, I've never, I, I've never had a hard time, like with at least, you know, I haven't felt like I've been upset with the church or, you know, felt like leaving or anything or felt like I was upset with God. I know a lot of people can, I, I definitely, um, can sympathize sympathize with that but i just mm. i just really feel like um god's always been there with me and mm. you know i understand that suffering is is a part of this life um it's gonna it's different for a lot of people but the same for a, a lot of others and um you know i think you know part of the reason we're we're here is to be there you know for each other as mm-hmm. you know um as uh followers of Christ and to be Christ-like and, and loving towards others who are struggling, like, you know, this this um, young woman who's mm-hmm. struggling with crack addiction or those who struggle with PTSD mm-hmm. um, and or depression or um, whatever, you know, it's, we we're called to, you know, to love them, to help mm-hmm. them and uh, pray for them. And yeah, so I, yeah. I just really feel like through this, through all of this, um, my relationship with with Christ has actually been strengthened, mm-hmm. and I'm just so so thankful. I, I feel like I'm more thankful for you know what I have now, and mm-hmm. you know, and who I am than mm-hmm. I ever was before. Because uh, when I was at my lowest, I mean, I had like the worst self esteem, and really just thought very low of myself. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I feel like things have changed. Mm-hmm. Um, changed a lot for me. It's still still a struggle for me in terms of uh, 
one of the big things is not trying to beat myself up for everything. And, you know, when I really struggled with OCD, it was having these intrusive thoughts that I really mm-hmm. feel like I shouldn't have and felt awful for having them. Mm. Um, and that just kind of brought me lower, made the depression worse. And, um, mm. but, uh, but through the therapy and the help I've gotten, it's, uh, you know, and just being allowed to have these thoughts and not feel like these, every thought, intrusive thought I had was some kind of sin that God mm-hmm, was, mm-hmm. you know, ashamed of me for having right, him, you right, know, right. Um, right. Is he, he isn't, you know, and he loves me, he understands, you know, our struggles. And, um, so that's, that's made it's a big hard. difference. I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah. And of course I, I do. I very yeah. much appreciate you sharing that. And I, it's hard, I think for a lot of people to understand until they really get it, that thoughts right. that we can be a victim to our own thoughts, right? Mm-hmm. That that might sound crazy to a person, but it's it's not crazy. Well, no. I mean that in a good way. In other words, that might sound silly or nonsensical, right, or yeah. irrational. Well, it is irrational because it's not it's not part of the train of thought, right? Yeah. But before we think that's too crazy, I mean, if you think if you're listening, to, you know, the podcast, you think, well, that that's just silly. Think of how many times in your life that you thought of something. You where in the world did that come from? Right. Why did that just come up with that thought all of a sudden? Why would I think about? And some, and oftentimes the shock is something that goes against what in saying psychology against our value system. Yeah, against our ethical. Like I would never do that. Why did I just think that? What happened on the sofa? Well, just because I'm a dirty sinner. That's got to be the reason mm-hmm. why. Some people go that route. Right. I, I I don't. I don't. Right. I don't think. I think that that's part of the human condition that the brain itself is firing off, and relates to the rational part of the soul called mind. Right. And draws up a thought. Uh, it works both ways mm-hmm. that our thoughts can affect our brain. Our brain can affect our thoughts. Right. Yeah. And and by the way, I'm a mind body dualist. I don't think they're the same thing. Right. But I think much like a hand uses a glove, the glove can affect the hand, the hand can affect the glove. Right. Yeah. So I think it's hard for people to understand that, to say we can be a victim to our own thoughts. Mm-hmm. That's exactly right. I think so. And then, and I've, and then the victim to that addiction and the person who's struggling with that needs to be reminded and be told that, it's not a sin to have intrusive thoughts. It's not a sin to struggle with that. Yeah. It is most of the time involved with all kinds of biochemical issues that the, that scientists are still learning about. Right. I hope they keep learning about it. I hope we yeah. can find that medication. Some people are prone to migraines. Well, mm-hmm. they have direct medication. Right. They're just prone to it. Mm-hmm. They're not sinners. Yeah. They don't need to repent of migraines. They yeah. need to get some aspirin for crying out loud or whatever it is, mydol, whatever they call them. That's what they need. They don't need to repent. They're not sinners because of migraines. The same thing. Some people have very, very low dopamine, have low serotonin, or they don't sleep well, or they have. So that stuff is not repented of. And that's why for me in my life, in the, I don't know how many years, but a long time now, I've always tried to consistently make a distinction between righteous and moral versus healthy and unhealthy. Right. Yeah. And I think those distinctions are good. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's a sin to eat donuts. I think it's unhealthy. Yeah. And we can use that category. And in my experience, so many people don't make that distinction. They say the word bad. Yeah. It's bad for you. The problem is bad also is what we use for moral categories. Yeah. And so when people use the word bad, it associates with moral categories, which associates for a lot of people to shame. Yeah. So the four donuts I had yesterday was the four, pretty that's, evil. Th- that's yeah. the point of this that's podcast. Yeah. I'm okay. leading to the fun. You need to repent. <laughs> Of the four bone of yeah, the man. <laughs> you know yeah. how it is that people say, yeah. oh, those are so bad for you. Right. But yeah. people don't hear that and go, I, I recognize that's not good for my health. Right. Well, they hear it. They, everyone I've ever met. Yeah. But if, if I say this right now, those are bad for you. You don't feel good about yourself. You start feeling, I know, I know better. Right. We, yeah. we associate shame with that. Mm-hmm. Shame is a sense of I'm not good. Right. It's different from guilt. Yeah. All right. Guilt is I've done something wrong. I know I've done something wrong. Shame is I'm not good for what right. I've done. Mm-hmm. It's a personal value statement. And a lot of Christians get mad about that too. David, it's ridiculous. You shouldn't have a good ego because you are should be ashamed of yourself all the time. You're constant. I don't find that biblical. Right. I know I'm guilty in front of God. Mm-hmm. And I can be ashamed as a sinner. But as a Christian, I should not be. As a Christian, right. I don't live in shame. I've mm-hmm. been freed from that. But yeah. anyway. Um, like love your neighbor right. as yourself. You yeah, know, and you love just, myself first. Yeah, right. Exactly right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, I'm a dirty, rotten sinner. Every yeah. second I'm like, what in the world? I, what? <laughs> I'm a new creation. Yeah. So, yeah. Loser? No, I, I, <laughs> yeah. that was that was Dorian. So that's I can take it. I can take it. I can take it. I was hurt. I was hurt. I'm not hurt. Um, but that's why I tend not to use the word bad. Right, like bad for you when he's healthy because that distinction. I was, and my own children. I don't know. That's bad. For, I try not to. Maybe sometimes it slips out. But I try to say mm. that's an unhealthy option. Right. Like, I might sound like a daggum 
stupid cyborg or Spock. That is unhealthy for you. <laughs> yeah. But I'd rather say that vocabulary all yeah, the time. Right. Give them category versus this is not good for my body. Mm-hmm. That means it's bad for my soul. Right, yeah. The other thing I would say is, the therefore, so should Christians ever say repent when it comes to these kind of addictions? And my response is, yes, when the person is having the moment of clarity. Mm. If the person knows they see the destruction, they believe they've lost control, and that's unhealthy, and they say, I don't want to get treatment, I will not get it, then I would say, then you are in that moment, there is some, even if it's 10%, part of you, some part of you is choosing to continue into a victimhood state where you lose self-control. Right. Now, I said at least 10% or whatever percentage. My point is, I'm fully cognizant. That when you have people in these meth and crack or porn or sex acts, sometimes the addiction is so powerful. Yeah. Even when you're quote unquote moment of clarity, you're barely there. Right. You're just barely there. And mm-hmm. so it, it if you if a person never experienced that before, then you can't understand how to say I want to beat this crack. It's no big deal. Yeah. It is like saying I want to go kill myself and change myself brand new. It, right. It is so yeah. powerful. It's difficult for them to articulate. Mm-hmm. The, all they like on meth. I've heard. I've seen the interviews. The people that like they. I mean, they'll sell their children. They've sold everything. I've seen whole families where every their house is bare empty, yeah. and they're all addicted to it. They sell themselves, their bodies. They'll steal, just about kill to do anything at all. Mm-hmm. And so even when they have a moment of clarity, they look around and go, "Man, this really stinks." Yeah, I felt awful about this. Okay, what's next? I need to go. My, no, it's such a quick feeling. Wow. Yeah. So even the moments, the really really bad ones. If they have any kind of moment of clarity, it is those moments to which we say, God, please help me when I have my clarity. Yeah. But even though most addicts are going to have to have support, they're going to mm-hmm. come around and they're going to have to have someone say, let me help you take you to right. the treat center and mm-hmm. and they're going to help. But I don't, again, one more time, I don't think the disease is a sin. I think it is a disease. I think she's exactly right. It is yeah. a disorder. The brain gets rewired. We become a victim to the addiction. Mm-hmm. I do not think we need to ask forgiveness for an addiction. Yeah. I think when you ask forgiveness... From Jesus once, mm-hmm. but then confess that as sin. Right. When we choose not to get help, when we have enough sense about ourselves mm-hmm. to go get the help, and we don't do it. Yeah. And that's yeah. for anybody. Mm-hmm. That's for anybody. I know right. I ought to go visit that church down the street, and I don't go for thirty years. Right. I'm not growing as a disciple. Well, then you should confess that. Say, mm-hmm. you know, what? I need to get. I need to be part of the body of Christ. Right. Yeah. Well, there's mm-hmm. no difference. Yeah. Absolutely. And if it could come out of the shadows with that shame, if the church could be, we just got work to do. And I know there are a lot of churches doing a very good job. A lot of churches, a lot of churches these days. Mm-hmm. I did life coaching the other day with a guy who's a counselor at a church. Yeah. A lot of churches these days are doing it well. They have counselors on staff, the ones that can afford it, mm-hmm. or the ones that even have on retainer or nearby. I've worked at several churches where there were counselors on staff mm-hmm. and gone to and worked on churches. And that's yeah. the way to do it. So a lot of the shame is fading right uh, yeah the what's the word i guess maybe the embarrassment of it or the awkwardness of it or the mm-hmm. what's the word i'm looking for um stigma the stigma that's yes. related to it yeah oh, that's going away it yeah. is still there and if you listen to the podcast i hope that you'll I hope this helps encourage you when you think yeah. about these things you meet someone one of the greatest things you can have for a person who's having severe depression severe addiction whatever or the certainly when it comes to the family who's suffering horribly through this. They're suffering more than the addict is. Yeah. Because the addict's high. Mm -hmm. The addict's drunk. The addict's getting the thrill. The family's not. Yeah. They just get to see their family and loved ones suffer constantly. Mm -hmm. What you need to do is pray for them. You need to have empathy for them. You need to be sad for them. You need to say, I'm so sorry. You need to say, what can I do to help you? Let me bring you dinner. Let me, and that I'm a safe place for you to be wounded and and imperfect. Right. And and there's nothing quick fix back to this. Mm -hmm. I've met with families, uh, couples whose, whose son has been through, uh, Rehabilitation, you know, four or five, six times. Right. They've just and the daughters who have eating disorders over and over and over and over. They've done treatment, and she's back in the same boat. Mm-hmm. And she might spend the rest of her entire life. It is a stinking struggle, and yeah. we have, should we should have, as you said, loving our neighbor. They're mm-hmm. our neighbors. Yeah. We should care for their need. We should have mm-hmm. deep empathy for that. And if we can't have empathy, then keep our mouth shut. Right. Yeah. Period. Right. Period. Yeah. People can call serious destruction. And how people leave the church because mm-hmm. you, they run their mouth off. Well, you should just give it to Jesus. Yeah. What do you think they've been doing? Yeah. Mm-hmm. For turn to, you think they wanted their son and daughter to be crack addicts? I mean, that right. stuff just, it frustrates me, obviously, I think. Yeah. And then, of course, I think now that's another person who's mm-hmm. going to leave the church for 30 years or whatever it is because of one person ran their mouth. Right. And God loves them anyway. And I, I get it. Yeah. But we can do better than that. We can have empathy yeah. and say, maybe I don't fully understand it. 
yeah so many people left the church from being hurt by people like that um even if just one person says something very insulting and degrading to what they're going through and that's it it's like i came here to be loved and cared about for um who i am and i'm struggling um and i get that kind of um attitude or response back and the awful feeling it's like why would i want to come back here again yep. most and, people already feel shame right they yeah. already feel mm-hmm. like they don't need help <laughs> right yeah they don't need help to be embarrassed yeah they don't need it and that's what of course the word they're going to use is judge mm-hmm. they're already judging themselves they already right. feel the judgment <clears throat> in a place i don't mm-hmm. blame them i don't yeah. blame them. i mean i could tell you store after store and i won't i mean anecdotal especially in my line of work the stores of people who finally had the courage to open up or find whatever and then it was that one that common right. face and now ideally they would have the self-esteem to go and the wherewithal to go that's just one person or there's two people or whatever it is and they're not everybody it's not the whole church it's for like right. jesus i'm not leaving the faith they're just a punk or maybe they're immature right maybe they're scared by that big news it's just that most people aren't there most right. people are too sensitive yeah they're like yeah. having a horrible sunburn and someone just slapped them and they're like forget it I'll get slapped every time I walk in the door. Yeah. Though that might be true at some. Most mm-hmm. churches are not like that. And by a little footnote, by the way, um, oftentimes when people want to join my church or yeah. get involved, I almost always say, I try to I try to always say, don't forget you're joining a church. These are not perfect people. We worship the perfect right. Savior. Yeah. We will fail you somehow. Mm-hmm. I'm going to fail you if I haven't already. It's going to happen. Right. Uh, there's some really awesome people here and some are still punks and we're working all this together and join the waters right. is fine. I mean, right. you know yeah, yeah. So mm-hmm. I'm trying to give you realistic expectations that uh, when people want to become a Christian, uh, the woman you met earlier today, yeah. I led to Christ. I, I mean, I was as adamant as I can be all the time. You yeah. need to understand. Right. When you follow Jesus, you're not following Jesus because of me. Right. I know you like me and my wife and I appreciate that, but, and I, I do. Yeah. Yeah. But I didn't save anybody. Yeah. And so if, if I die yeah. tomorrow, you can't stop being a disciple of Jesus. Right. And yeah. that's how it is when it comes to people who mm-hmm. hurt us, which breaks yeah. my heart. That I want them to say, no, 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 please don't judge yeah. the church. Or, Lord, don't even judge Jesus for sure Right. on how much yeah. we fail you. Because we will. Mm-hmm. Um, we will. But having said that, um, mm-hmm. yeah. well, my heart breaks for this mama. So, mama, stay strong. Yeah. Stay strong. You're not alone. You're not alone. Yeah. You're not alone. No matter what evil tells you, you are not alone. Do not give up. Uh, in your faith, uh, don't please don't give up in trying to find some community of faith where you can worship and study the Bible mm-hmm. together and do service and do mission projects because that's how you grow as a disciple. And and finally, I want to say I'm so encouraged by the fact of so many times in the New Testament, people go through horrible, wretched things and they're devout disciples of Jesus. Right. I mm-hmm. think about the Apostle Paul, who, whatever it was, he says, you know, two Corinthians that he prayed that the thorn be taken away from his flesh and yeah. God basically finally said no mm-hmm. my grace is efficient it's enough for you to make it right yeah and that that's it he goes alright so I'm going to boast all the more because my weakness yeah. you're making this woohoo I want my weakness I want to be weak because yeah. you made me strong his and powers made perfect it's made weakness, perfect I mean, you know? it's, that's right it, it, it's completed it, it complete, makes whole yeah. it's perfected and, and secondly and that's not just lip service right As atheist hears that and go whatever but if you're a Christian from the inside when we feel that kind of peace, not every day, not all the right. time, but there does come a peace that passes understanding. It says, mm-hmm. no, he has given me the strength. He's brought those people in my life. He's brought those therapists. He's brought the meds. He's done whatever. Something in me tells me he's been with me. Mm-hmm. And why didn't he take it all away? He didn't want to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He didn't want to. Right. If he wanted to, he would do it. Right. And the question is, why not? Well, to which I say, I don't know. God hasn't revealed to me. Why hasn't taken away everyone's disorder? Yeah. And he's never revealed that to me. Yeah. Uh, there's no one in the Bible where he says, why not? And if a person won't trust God until they know every single reason why he hasn't done what they wanted, right. then you will never trust God. Right. Mm-hmm. My children would never come to trust me mm-hmm. if they would only trust me every single time I could explain everything I did. Right. They wouldn't do it. Yeah. And I wouldn't blame them. Right. Yeah. I'd say you can need to find other parents, someone who's going to explain to you every single time why everything I do from yeah. year, one year old, two year old, three year old, all the time. But mm-hmm. times I'm just not going to. Sometimes I just can't do it because you won't get it. Right. And but do you know enough about me to trust me? Yeah. When I don't explain why. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All I know is finally the last thing I want to say was I know that in the world to come there's no more disorders, there's no more crack, right? There's no more meth, there's no more depression, there's none of these things, and so in the world to come. 
praise Jesus, is all different. There's a new heavens, new earth, new body that yeah. will be addicted. And um, yeah, part of magic will be even more handsome than you are right now. I mean, I, that's, well, that's the I don't know. I mean, God got me pretty yeah, darn he is perfect pretty close, here. If you think yeah. about it, there's Chuck Norris number one. Yeah, a close second maybe. I know. Yeah, Chuck. Chuck is just. He's untoppable. He's just... <laughs> he was the he's mold. Perfect. He was, but then yeah. But he broke it when it came out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right, right, exactly. When Chuck Norris was born, yeah. he, he, the doctors didn't slap him, he slapped them. Yeah, exactly. Because no one slaps Chuck Norris. Yeah. <laughs> he dropped his... He, uh, he took his mom home from the Chuck, hospital he, he after he was born. Yeah. <laughs> and drove her home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Uh, we, we need to do a just whole podcast and Chuck Norris jokes. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, just a little levity at the end of this uh, serious <laughs> podcast. God bless you, mama and dads. Don't give up. If you're having an addiction, don't give up. Go get help. Go yeah. get help. Get treatment. Yeah. Please don't give up on Jesus or the church. Uh, there is hope. And ask for his strength. Ask for the spirit to help you. And if you feel inspired to go get help, then sister or brother, follow the inspiration. Go get it. And don't mm-hmm. give up. God yeah. bless you. See you next time. God bless you. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast. I really do hope that you enjoyed it. I hope you'll listen more. If you want more, go to davidpendergrass.com. There are tabs at the top that let you have access to all the podcasts I've recorded, to sermons I've done, uh, books I've written. They're all there at davidpendergrass.com. You can also check me out on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash glimpse of the kingdom, facebook.com forward slash glimpse of the kingdom. And also look at my Twitter feed at glimpse the kingdom. Or at Dr. D. Pendergrass. At Dr. D. Pendergrass. There are tons of ways reached out. I hope you will. Send me your questions. Send me your comments. If you'd like to support the ministries of Glimpse of the Kingdom, you can also find ways to give online on davidpendergrass.com. If you'd like for me to come and do some consulting, check out my website, davidpendergrassconsulting.com, and I'll be happy to come out and speak to your organization and help and train any way I can. God bless you. See you online.